Um, today we'll cover taphonomy, ancient biological molecules, living bacteria, and, and a bit about carbon-14. So taphonomy is the study of decaying things. Um, it's a lot of really smelly research. Like people will um, like leave things like shrimp or fish in a tank and just watch how it falls apart. Um, and it gives us really important insights into how fossils form. So it's weird that Earth has a fossil record. And I think that this should be pretty intuitive. If the cow dies or a gopher dies, it doesn't leave a fossil. It just doesn't. Um, you know, if a fish dies in the ocean, it doesn't leave a fossil. Um, so how in the world would we ever expect a fossil record to exist on Earth? It's a very strange thing. Um, the only, uh, so as a rule, modern environments don't fossilize dead, dead organisms. Dead organisms get recycled and they get, uh, the nutrients get you know, kind of turned over for the next generation. But there's this extraordinary break in the fossil record. So pre-Pleistocene fossils are preserved in waterborne sediment and Pleistocene to present fossils, the few that we do have, are preserved in natural traps like ice tar and caves. So I'll go into that in a bit. Um, Pleistocene, when you think Pleistocene, think of the Ice Age, basically. So everything from the Ice Age to the present, if, if it's preserved at all, it's in tar, natural, it's in tar, it's in caves, it's in peat, um, it's in ice. Uh, so, we'll, so, so to go over this a bit, um, this is the, International Chronostratigraphic Chart. And this is not, the, the dates are not to scale. Um, notice that there's vastly more time in the pink, purple, fuchsia colored section on the right. There's vastly more time, um, billions of years in that bit, and then hundreds of millions in the rest of it. Um, the, the Pink purple part to the right starts with Hadean at the bottom, and then it goes up to the Ediacaran. If you look at the very top right corner, most of that has no fossils. There is something that we call the Ediacaran fauna, which is some very strange fossils of some very strange organisms that lived maybe maybe pre-flood. I don't know. It, it's it's a really interesting bit of fossils. They're, they're not that common. Um, and all of that together, we call it the Precambrian. And notice that it, if you look at the numerical age in millions of years, I'm sorry, it's pretty small on the screen, but if you look at numerical age in millions of years, it goes from 4,600 million, so 4.6 billion, all the way up to 538.8 million. So it covers over 4 billion years with that little, with that bit there of, of time, um, according to standard geological chronology. And then the rest of it, we call it the Phanerozoic, which just means it has life, uh, as in like zoology. So the Phanerozoic record is everything from Cambrian to the present. Um, that's where we find fossils with uh, living organisms in them that used to be alive. And that, that's typically thought of as these are all basically flood rocks up until the Pleistocene of some kind, there's, there's a lot of debate over where exactly the flood ended. Um, so some people think that the flood ended, if you look at the very left side of the chart, um, there's green down at the bottom, it says upper and lower Cretaceous, and then there's kind of the orangish and it says the Paleogene, and you got Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. Um, so some people think that the flood ended between that green and the orangish brown color and some people think it ended up a little higher, and I'm not sure, honestly. I, I, I can see the data on both sides of the debate, and I really don't know. Um, but there are waterborne fossils right up to the Pleistocene at the very top left corner. So here we have the, the very, very old rocks, probably pre-flood in general. Um, 
don't really have fossils. They do have some stromatolites, which may be bacterial fossils. Um, and then we have this, the very left top corner of the chart here, where we have the Holocene at the very top um, and the Pleistocene. And those are the fossils that are preserved in natural traps, tar, ice, caves, peat. So back to the whole thing, just kind of put that in perspective. We have this vast, vast stretches of geologic time, supposedly, um, where everything is preserved in waterborne sediment everything. And then you get up to the present time and it's preserved in a completely different way. The, the, what this indicates would be a, a complete change in geologic process between the Ice Age and everything before the Ice Age. Now that should be utterly bizarre to geologists, but people don't think about it enough. Um, now I would say that it fits very well with the flood theory. Um, so the Pleistocene fossils, this is California during the Pleistocene. And uh, so we got elephants, we got lions, we've got rhinoceros, we've got horses, some, or some members of the horse family. Um, we have camels and sloths and antelope, and it's just an interesting mix of animals. Now, what's interesting to me is that if you were to take this image that someone has recreated and just change the coats of the animals, give those horse, you know, give, give the horse family their, you know, black and white stripes, take the hair off the elephant. It's like, oh, it's Africa, right? Um, but no, this was California after the flood. Um, here is, this is from the Page Museum. I guess it's called the Tar Pit Museum now in Los Angeles where at the tar pits and this is a, um, a a mammoth that they pulled out of the tar pits um this is a saber-toothed cat that they pulled out of the tar pits um these are here's a couple of guys working in the tar pits excavating bones they even found a human in the tar pits with with the animals uh, here's a bear fossil from a cave Um, this guy has his own museum in Italy. He, this is Utzi, the, the Iceman from the Alps that was found in, back in the 90s, if you remember. Um, and this is a reconstruction of what he would have looked like. And they found him up there in the Alps, kind of being uncovered by ice, by melting ice. And they thought that someone had died recently. And so they, you know, they called the authorities and found out, oh, no, this is actually a major archaeological discovery. Um, anthropological discovery. Um, okay, now those, so those are Pleistocene to present fossils. And here are some pre-Pleistocene fossils. This is from the Eocene, this is Green River Formation, Wyoming. And if you look at that fish carefully, you can see two things. One is that it hasn't decayed at all. Um, it looks like it's in very good condition. And the second thing, now, fish, fish tend to decay. I mean, in three days, you'll have a lot of decay in a dead fish. Um, so this, so three days did not pass before this fish got buried, just looking at the condition of, this, of the fossil. But it could have been much faster than three days because if you look at the mouth of the fish, you see a tail of another fish sticking out. Um, so this fish got caught mid-meal and buried. Uh, here's a bunch more fish. Also, these fish, no decay visible on these fish either with a big palm frond. Now, this is actually a horse skeleton um, from shortly after the flood, probably. Uh, although, again, not sure about that, but this is a horse skeleton. Um, and again, it's surrounded by fish. Um, I usually make the kids in the audience guess what this is. Um, and somebody usually gets it. This is a bat. And again, it was found in a lake with fish. Um, this guy, the, there were some interesting organisms that lived before the flood. Uh, this is a, a salamander-like creature, an amphibian named Diplocalus pretty big. Um, and here's his skeleton. 
Um, this guy, now this may be a little bit exaggerated, um, but uh, this is a mosasaur, and you can see, like, this was a huge animal. Um, and here's the skeleton there. Uh, this guy, they had millipedes before the flood that were that big. Um, and there's his skeleton. This was found in England. And again, it's deposited in waterborne sediment. Um, these guys lived before the flood. And again, waterborne sediment. They're all preserved in waterborne sediment. Um, this guy's an interesting creature. This is just a dragonfly, but he's that big. Um, so again, all of these creatures, whether they're they live, whether they fly, whether they're terrestrial animals, um, whether they're sea creatures, every fossil from before the, like every fossil, you know, looking at it from a biblical perspective, all the fossils that we have that were formed during the flood were, of course, they're in waterborne sediment. Um, and then everything after the flood, it gets, you know, falls into tar, it falls into a cave, um, and it gets preserved that way. Um, so that totally makes sense. But again, this does not make sense in a different, like in the evolutionary scenario, extremely, well, I, I've never even heard anybody try to explain why there's so many waterborne fossils, like waterborne sediment buried fossils in the old rocks and basically none in the present day rocks. Um, this one is fascinating and this has created a lot of debate in the scientific literature these biomolecules, biological molecules, these come from the fossils. They actually are still part of the fossil. And there's a lot of these different molecules. They find fats and proteins and other like, uh, just a lot of different types of biological molecules in fossils still. And this is a surprise. They, they started finding this a lot more recently because people started looking for it. Um, for a long time, people just assumed it didn't exist because the fossils, they thought the fossils were too old. But they found DNA from a human that they think is 45,000 years old. They found DNA from a horse they think was 700,000 years old. And from a termite and a bee that they thought were about 30 million years old. Um, and that is really extraordinary because the half-life of mitochondrial DNA is about 521 years based on a really good study. And the half-life of nuclear DNA, so the micro mitochondrial DNA is what we get from our mothers exclusively. And it's not in the nucleus of the cell, it's in the mitochondria. Um, the half-life of the DNA in the nucleus of the cell is about half of that. So the DNA that you would think of as your DNA is like, you know, you send it off to 23andMe, that's the nuclear DNA. And they are, and that is, it has a half-life of, you know, according to this, it'd be 260 years. Um, that's nothing. That's absolutely nothing compared to, th to the thousands of years that they think this stuff should, or even or millions even, that they think this stuff should have been around. The reason DNA has a short half-life is because DNA actually needs to be there's a lot of requirements chemically for DNA to add, to do its job. If DNA were to stick together really hard, um, your, your, your bio, your, the little machines inside of your cell that read the DNA wouldn't be able to read it. Like you, you have these little um, enzymes that, that or these little machines that pop the DNA apart and then it reads it, reads one side or the other side and then it goes and makes a protein out of that or it does something else with it. Um, and it, so that DNA has to be pulled apart. It has to be read and then put back together. And if it were stuck together really hard, like a really tough chemical bond, um, that wouldn't be possible. Just one quick example. Um, so it's, bio, it's biologically necessary that DNA be quite fragile. And I think last week we talked about DNA repair mechanisms. Um, 
and how much damage your DNA gets every single day. And it's a lot worse than the one figure I quoted. Um, your, your DNA gets damaged so many times a day and you have these little machines that just fix everything. Um, this one was cool. This is a T-Rex red blood cell. And so they pulled this out of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They, they dissolved part of the bone in acid and they found this tissue in the bone left over after the acid had dissolved the mineral out and found red blood cell. They found some other tissue, other protein. And again, this is supposed to be tens of millions of years old, but this stuff breaks down and decays pretty quickly. Um, and it, but it even gets crazier because they didn't just find biological molecules, they actually found living bacteria that they were able to culture in a petri dish in the lab and do like DNA testing on the bacteria. So they found bacteria from in uh, thirty in salt that they thought was thirty four thousand years old. I think that was in California, Death Valley ish. Uh, they found bacteria in five hundred thousand year old ice that thought they thought it was that old. They thought they they found bacteria in one hundred and twenty million and two hundred fifty million year old salt. You know, according to standard geological time. Um, now, there's a number of problems with this. Um, radiation, so we, all of us are a little bit radioactive. Um, potassium, has, there's a percentage of potassium that is radioactive. And we have quite a bit of potassium in our bodies. And so all of us have a little bit of radioactivity just from the potassium. Salt has potassium in it too. Um, and that radioactive potassium should damage the DNA and the cellular machinery of the, of the bacteria over time. Um, even, and, and the bacteria is going to need to keep using food. It's going to have to keep eating. Um, even dormant bacteria have to maintain basic metabolic activity like DNA repair. Um, and then this is a big one. This is really the big one when it comes to these kinds of studies. Metabolic waste buildup will kill the bacteria in much less than 34,000 years. So a good example of that happening is when you, like somebody puts yeast into a bottle of grape juice and seals it. And eventually that yeast produces so much alcohol that the alcohol kills the yeast. Um, the alcohol is a metabolic byproduct of, of the yeast consuming the sugar. Um, and bacteria, uh, you know, it, it'll have different metabolic wastes, but uh, the, the, any, any like metabolic waste will kill the bacteria if it's trapped in a bubble in salt. Um, and yet it's still there. And, and so that's, that's pretty baffling to a lot of people. And I want to try to describe how different 34,000 years and 250 million years are. So if that orange circle on the left is 250 million years worth of time, and you take 1% of it and make a new pie chart out of that 1%, only 1.3% of that new pie chart is, I mean, that's 34,000 years. So 34,000 years is an insurmountable obstacle. And yet we find bacteria in salt that's supposed to be 250 million years old. Um, so, uh, uh, clearly, the I mean, it's, the best explanation is that, again, it's just not that old. And it's really interesting to me that they can, they then, they can do genetic, genetic testing on the bacteria. And usually they're astonished at how little it has evolved in what they think, uh, not th that bacteria, um, but, you know, they, they think that the modern bacteria would be very different because you know 250 million years of evolution, but it's not, it's not that different. It's different, but not that different. Um, so that's just really interesting. And I wanna talk about carbon 14. So you, I'm sure that some of you have heard that car, doesn't carbon 14 disprove the Bible and doesn't carbon 14 prove that the earth is super old? Um, actually, no, no, no. Um, explain a little bit about how carbon-14 works. You get carbon-14 formation in the upper atmosphere and then carbon-14 decay after an organism died, which I'll explain in a minute. And you get an equilibrium as long as carbon-14 is coming in and going out at the same rate, right? Now, as soon as the organism dies though, 
that formation, the, the carbon-14 coming into the organism stops. And so that level in the bottle starts to drop. And so you can, theoretically, you can measure the level in the bottle and figure out how long ago the organism died. So um, this is a good visual of how carbon-14 is formed. You get cosmic radiation coming in from the sun, really high energy particles that smash into things in the upper atmosphere and neutrons fly off. And those neutrons can hit nitrogen-14 in the atmosphere and when the nitrogen absorbs that neutron, it pops out a proton and it turns it into carbon-14. And then the carbon-14 becomes carbon dioxide. It gets absorbed into plants. Animals eat the plants. And when the plants and animals die, um, they stop absorbing the carbon-14, but the carbon-14 in their bodies continues decaying. Um, the half-life of carbon-14 is only about 5,730 years. So that's quite a short half-life. Now, that's really nice for biblical archaeology. That's a really good half-life to have for that kind of research. Um, it allows us to date things like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but that's not a, it's just not a very long half-life compared to millions of years. In fact, if the entire Earth were made of carbon-14, in a million years, there would be none left. It's because the half-life is so short. And yeah, we find carbon-14 in basically everything. This is graphite. Um, we find carbon-14 in what's well, supposed to be very ancient graphite. Um, we find it in coal. It's supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old. Um, the, the graphite and, well, the coal will often date to about 30,000 years old. Which again, that's that sounds old. It's supposed, to, you know, it's a lot older than the Bible says it is. But compare thirty thousand, like thirty thousand is a lot closer to six thousand than it is to two hundred million. Much, much closer. And I'll explain why it's not at six thousand in a bit. Um, diamonds. They find diamonds with carbon fourteen. And they date to like seventy thousand years old, maybe. And that's very bizarre. Um, Dinosaur bones have carbon-14. And in fact, there was an interesting story where the dinosaurs were, that somebody did a bunch of research on these dinosaur bones. They got a bunch of carbon dates and they actually went to a professional conference and presented their data at the conference. And it was so, they actually, I don't know how, it, it was so, I'm surprised that they got through, but then when, the, when they actually presented the data, um, it really upset people and they actually, pulled like if you go to that conference website now which i don't remember what it is apologize for that but you go to that conference website now um it jumps from one abstract to the like it skips the abstract where they present it and it goes straight to the next abstract it's just missing it's missing out of the program um they they deleted that abstract with the carbon 14 dinosaur bone dates from the conference proceedings so that's a, that's a suppression of data. That's actively suppressing scientific data. Um, so there are three options. One is contamination, one is measurement error. And if we can rule out contamination and measurement error, which they've done a lot of work doing that, um, it just means that the specimens aren't that old, which again is the obvious conclusion. Um, now, this is a graph that I made in Excel. And if anybody wants the formula, I'll, I'll pass that off to you. Um, so at, along the bottom of the graph, I have real age in years. And notice that it goes back to about 4,500, about the time of the flood. And then we've got the expected carbon-14 age, which tops out at about 75 or so thousand years. Um, so what that means now, if you go back, if you look here, that's 10,000. So we wouldn't expect anything to date back to 10,000 years using carbon-14 dates until it's for, I don't know, 4,200 years old or so. And down here at 3,000, it's about right at 3,000. Does that make, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. So when we can date things back to 2,500 years before present, 3,000 before present, 3,500-ish before present um, with carbon-14, and we don't get any major discrepancies until we start to get back to older material. 
um, at which point we have to calibrate here. So one story about that, uh, they excavated some sloth dung in a cave and they did carbon-14 on this, they did a bunch of carbon-14 there. So there was this whole pile of sloth was going to the bathroom in the same place regularly. And so they went through the whole pile and they did a bunch of carbon-14 dating. And it looked like the sloth was going to the bathroom once a year. Um, but if you, which is of course bizarre, but if you put that, if you like, if you put that, the, the, the dates of that they got, if you put that onto this chart, it pulls it together so that it's more like once a day, which makes a lot more sense. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons to, to think that, that this would be correct. And especially, so in other words, what this is saying is that if you have a flood and there's not a lot of carbon-14 production before the flood, we expect very, very low rates of carbon-14 in the environment at the time of the flood. And then the carbon-14 starts getting dumped into the environment at the time of the flood. Um, then you get, you get very quickly, you get all these dates from 70,000 years to 10,000 years. You get all those dates happening over just a few hundred years. And then things kind of start leveling out and we start getting more usable dates after that. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit, somebody, asked, so somebody last week asked why, you know, why this mattered a little bit about my testimony. And um, something that I found is that in difficult times, it helps to know for an absolute fact that God is literally holding you together at the subatomic level, like the Apostle Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. And um, when, uh, when things feel like God is not doing something for us that we think he should be doing or that... Um, or that maybe he that feels like he's not present, or it feels like um, like he's not actually taking care of a situation. Um, it helps to know for a fact that he is actually like holding you together, like all of your molecules together, and making everything work. Um, uh, we can see from science that God is extremely attentive to the very fine details of our existence. Um, so that's helpful, and uh, so. Um, I wanted to share a couple of stories. Um, when we, uh, so I graduated from Melinda, went to the University of Minnesota for a postdoc, and I was expecting the lawyers to be, at Melinda to be able to work out the financial, like the grant funding. I was, I was expecting them to be able to transfer the grant pretty quickly, and I ended up in Minnesota. So I started the process and I didn't know exactly, like you never know exactly when you're going to graduate in, in from PhD programs. <laughs> like it just, like stuff can happen and you have to take another quarter. And so I didn't want to start the paperwork too soon because I, I needed to start it when I knew I was actually going to graduate. Um, so I figured giving him five months was enough. Um, and so I started the paperwork five months before I, before I expected to show up in Minnesota. And showed up in Minnesota in August and they had not done their paperwork. And uh, so I started working at public schools, doing substitute teaching. My wife got a job pretty quickly. Um, and the lawyers just, uh, it took so long. Every signature was just taking forever. And it was really frustrating. Um, and, but God provided the entire time. Like uh, one, one of the crazy things that happened was my aunt called up and my dad had died a while before that. And my aunt called up and said, I got a letter from the bank about your dad's account. Um, so I went down to the account, filled out a couple of forms and they just wrote me a check for all the money that was in his account. Um, so that took care of a month's in the needs right there. And a bunch of other stuff happened. Uh, like we didn't, we never actually lacked money for all the time that I didn't, that I wasn't working at the university. And the important thing that happened was that I sent my wife down to the state, whatever department uh, helps with insurance just to get health insurance, just so I wouldn't get dinged on the income tax, not thinking I'd ever use it. And so they gave the whole family insurance 
And then um, when I started working, um, and something else that was frustrating that happened was that I started, I ended up getting quite a bit less salary than I was expecting because I'd gone and talked to them a couple of years before the postdoc. And they said, yeah, bring us, bring, you know, bring this much grant money and, you know, your salary, we'll give you this salary. Um, well, it ended up being a lot less, um, even though I did bring the amount of money that they asked for because of some stuff that happened at the lab. They had a lot more postdocs and they didn't want to pay me that much more than everybody else. Um, and so, uh, anyway, so that was frustrating. But then because of, well, okay, so I, I finally got, I got to Minnesota in August, didn't get paid till January. Um, and finally in, but what happened was that in January, because they had given me a lower salary, my wife did not get kicked off of the state insurance. Um, like we just, just, we came in just under the cutoff for the state insurance. Um, and uh, she ended up pregnant with triplets when we, like two weeks after we got to Minnesota. And so her entire prenatal care and the triplets birth and their time in the NICU was totally covered by insurance. Um, for the two, the two really frustrating things that happened, the one was waiting for five, waiting for all that time from August till January to get paid. And the, the second thing was not getting paid the salary that I was expecting. Those two things worked together to get the entire, all, like all the medical expenses for the triplets birth and NICU completely paid for. Um, and if, so it actually, it came out to a million dollars, the whole thing, which if you work in the medical field, that's probably not a surprise. Um, I mean, it was, but uh, if, if I hadn't had that extra state insurance, um, my portion would have been 40% of that. And because of what God did at the beginning of the year, when we showed up in Minnesota, that was totally taken care of. Um, and I, I got a lot more stories like that. Uh, one quick part of that was that um, we showed up to, they were taking care of her at the hospital in, in, uh, in the downtown hospital in Minneapolis. And we showed up for the last, very last appointment. And they said, our NICU's full. Um, what do you want to do? And so we ended up delivering that. It, and that had never happened before to them. Um, so we ended up delivering the babies in Burnsville, where we lived at the Burnsville hospital. It was right down the road from the house. Um, didn't have to pay for parking. And the Burnsville Hospital gave mothers with a baby in the NICU a free room. So she was able to stay in the hospital for six weeks uh, while all the babies got out of NICU. Uh, 